Good evening. It was the moment which was supposed to change the way the police in Britain look and behave, a moment which shocked a country to some of the realities of racism. The murder of Stephen Lawrence 20 years ago next week saw a black teenager killed because of the colour of his skin, but it also saw the Macpherson inquiry into the competence or otherwise of the police at the time, with the Metropolitan Police itself effectively on trial, accused of institutional racism. We want to devote a large part of the programme tonight to exploring what has changed in our institutions and society in those 20 years. First, here's some voices giving their answers and observations on relations between the police and part of the communities they serve. I don't feel that the police are on my side. The police have almost severed their ties with us. Um, they, they're not trusted. And so, you know, the police will be expecting people to cooperate with them, but you don't cooperate with people you don't trust. If you've never had any positive interactions with the police and you can't necessarily trust them, why should I or anyone else kind of put my trust in you? There are a lot of good police officers and I've come across quite a few good police officers myself but I've also come across um, some who, you know, abuse their, their powers. I believe one of the things that changed the relationship between the police and the community is that they were ready to listen. I went to the house where I... I was at university when Stephen was murdered and um, identified with him because it absolutely could have been me. It took the experience of black communities and part of what were very often private conversations about how those communities felt about the police and it took the lid off that and showed it to white society in such a way that was difficult for white society to deny. It was a moment in which the, a page turned on race relations. The quest for justice begun. Now it took too long but that has been a huge opportunity that still has to be seized. Here at Life Magazine, we deal with a range of you know, youth issues, anything from music, fashion, news, politics. But one of the issues that keeps coming up is policing and how the police um, deal with the community. And one of the issues that we were discussing is the issue of stop and search. I can recall the first time I got stopped and search, and I think I was, I think, 13. When I was 11, I'd been to go and see Harry Potter with my friend in Sutton. And because my school's in Sutton, I have a season ticket to get there um, for, for the whole term. So it was quite an expensive ticket. And when I came back um, from, and I was leaving the station, the police were doing the ticket checks and the Oyster card checks to make sure everyone had paid for their journey. And um, when I gave the officer my ticket, he was asking me where did I get the money for the ticket and stuff. And then, um, you know, he got me to empty out my pockets. It's, it can be quite humiliating for, you know, for a person just to be kind of put out in public while other people are just going about their business, you know, it's, it's not a great feeling. And I think just my, like my many times experiencing that and just in the way that the police interact with me, it's, you know, it's tainted my relationship with the police. And I, I was quite upset about the whole thing and, you know, it was quite scary because mm. I didn't see what I'd done wrong. And in some ways there, I think, like, that's when your innocence um, gets lost because, you know, it's the police. The police are the people that, you know, you go to when you're lost. The police are those nice people that will help you on the street. But um, after you've experienced stop and search, I think your perception of them changes. Guys, 
you've got to look at stop and search in the, in the context of the investigation of street crimes. That's the issue that you're looking at because you're either trying in the, in the immediate aftermath of a crime to find a suspect and find evidence by flooding an area with police officers and then searching everybody that you, that you come across. Or you're doing it in a way that you, you've had information that, that a certain group of people are selling drugs and you're hoping to intervene in that and maybe get dr uh, recover drugs and, uh, and, and get evidence for a prosecution. Everything that we know about policing requires cooperation of the public. If, if the public are alienated, and, it's, and the public aren't alienated just because of policing, but if the police are engaging with the public in ways which adds to that sense of frustration, which adds to that sense of alienation, then the, police, the, the public are not going to come forward, are not going to cooperate, are not going to act as witnesses, are not going to give inf information in the same way that they would, and that's the lifeblood of policing. In 1993, I don't recollect a serious concern about gang violence and gangs. There were not young people being stabbed in our streets uh, or gunned down. So I think that the political pressure to do something about that led to an increase in stop and search. And that stop and search was badly, badly mishandled. My cousin was, was murdered in October 2007. And um, the case was on, you know, it wasn't solved. Uh, it was a situationist where he was, I guess it, it came across that he was in the wrong place at the wrong time. Someone must have seen something. Someone must have heard something. And, you know, might have the smallest bit of information. But perhaps fear made them keep quiet. Um, and so because of that, the police didn't really have enough to go on to solve the situation. The police kind of expect you to cooperate with them and, you know, tell them everything. But if you, you know, once you do that, you know, they, they go back to their station and stuff, but it's you who still has to stay in the community and you kind of have to deal with the aftermath of that. So, you know, if you were to kind of, if you were to tell them something in confidence, and then it comes out that it was you who kind of, you know, who told them and they're not there to actually protect you, then, you know, it's, it's a bad situation. Too often the police rely on reference groups and, uh, and, 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 and ways in which the community can speak to the police when in the end what we need is for the police to be the community so that we have a police service, not a police force. The 20-year-old was shot three times. The police say they have no motive for his killing. Dory Mackay was driving his car along this road in nearby Hume. In 1999, I had a call one evening to say that my son was shot. And by the time I reached the hospital, he was dead. My son was shot three times in the back. One of the bullets was fatal. So we've never actually heard anything about the case. We've heard rumours on the street, but I, the rumours are just rumours, so I, I don't like talking about them. I did not believe my son was part of a gang, and no one has ever said that before his death or after his death. I went out trying to find out where the gangs were hanging out, what I could do to meet them and talk to them. One of the things that happened quite a lot and it was complained about a lot with young, man, young black men was the police and the way they treated them on the streets and sometimes for no apparent reason they would be stopped and searched. I felt that what the police was doing, the relationship with the police and, and black men wasn't really very good and it was getting worse really. The high proportion of murders, shootings, has dropped drastically and that is all because the police and the community has come together, the police has listened to the community and now we are working together and whenever you work together, whenever you come together and work together, then things are going to change. 
and I think it's naive to, um, uh, to believe that um, uh, there aren't communities where the police are hated. Um, and if you start talking about trying to build trust in those kind of areas, you know, you've got a long way to go before you even get to the starting line. And uh, this mistrust has been built up over many, many years with problems on both sides, maybe problems on uh, insensitive policing on the one hand, but also problems with a, a very high crime rate on the other hand. The fundamental question today is a question of trust. All public authorities actually there are big questions of trust we've seen this with MPs uh, we've seen this with the journalists all sorts of sections of community there are questions of trust but I think if policing by consent is to survive then there needs to be considerably more trust between young people and the police and between parts of not all of but parts of the black community uh, and the police I understand that the police do have some difficult jobs to do and that you know and I understand that they might need the support of a community but in order to get the support of a community you need the trust of a community it's a hand in hand your community will support the police if the community trusts the police and in order for the community to trust the police the police need to you know show that they they are on the community side and they are here to help well, for their thoughts on what has changed since the Stephen Lawrence case, I'm joined by Sean Leopold, an Oxford graduate who works for an urban pop culture website and is also a marketing executive. The writer Drida Say Mitchell, Pastor Wayne Brown of the New Testament Church of God, the Reverend Rose Hudson Wilkins, who is chaplain to the Speaker of the House of Commons and to the Queen, and Assistant Commissioner Simon Byrne of the Metropolitan Police. I want to begin talking about the, the police if we can, because that was really what much of the report was about. Um, I just wonder what your thoughts were when you hear young people say it does change your perception of the police, who we need, mm. when you get stopped and searched and you get angry. I think firstly, um, it was, I think it was a really interesting film and uh, I'll take the cue from what you said in your introduction, Gavin, really. You talked about how oh, the police were on trial at the time of McPherson and, and, and the Lawrence murder and I think the analogy I draw, we, in a sense, we've been on probation ever since. So that the, the, some of the emotions and the stories there were very powerful. And I won't pretend that both personally, and as a police service and the police force, uh, we, we don't listen to those. I, I think since the, um, the Commissioner's come back in London, one of the things he's been particularly struck by is this story that was around about 18 months ago about, if you're frankly a young black man in London, your experience of stop search was not a great one. I think the best thing we can do is demonstrate by deed rather than words. And we have listened hard, and I'm sure people have experienced both in the room and outside the studio about what the Met has done. And I think we've done uh, some significant things, particularly around stop search, but there's more to do. So to give you some examples, we do less, so the number of stop searches have fallen. We do it more effectively, so about one in five people that we now stop, we, we, we get a result from, so we either arrest them, or we find some evidence, and we do it more fairly because uh, the number of complaints have fallen. Now, if you've taken all that together in a context where serious crime in London has fallen quite dramatically, because if you take the, uh, the example again from the film, uh, going back to Greater Manchester, my, my last force in actual fact, that serious youth crime which affects young men under the age of 25 has fallen by a third last year. Street robbery in London, as I see it today, but is down by nearly a third. Do you presumably, though, accept, you know, the young man who said, you know, I was coming from a Harry Potter film and I got stopped and searched, and it did change his perception. That still goes on, and that's not just a problem for him. It is a problem for you, because you presumably want to police with his consent and the consent of the rest of the community. Absolutely. That, I mean, that story does, it does not sound something I'd professionally be proud of. And I'd sort of, you go back to, as much as we're sitting here today, 20 years after an awful murder, we're also nearly 200 years after Sir Robert Peel found the modern police service on that principle that I'm just a person in uniform. I get my authority to police the streets as this each and every one of my officers from the people of London and we have to listen. Would it, would it help you as well as help the community if there were simply more black police officers which is something McPherson wanted, he wanted 7%, it's 5% in England and Wales, I know the Met figures are slightly yeah. different but you've had, you said Greater Manchester too, Sir Peter Fahey, their chief constable said it's not about political connect correctness, it's about operational need, we need we need a more diverse police service, and we haven't got it. 
No, we've made some improvements right through the ranks of the police service where over a period of time, for example, at the moment, the number of police officers on the streets in London is about 10%, but as your film showed, that doesn't reflect the population of London. As, as you know, the, the actual population of London and its demographics is changing really rapidly, and we just need to try and keep pace with that. I think... How, when, how do you do that? I mean, uh, I mean the, the whole question of positive discrimination usually comes up. Can you... Can you uh, deliberately select people and also promote them because it's not just as we'll discuss in a minute it's not just the police it's other institutions mm. too who fail to put uh, ethnically diverse people in the top ranks as well and that's yeah. certainly true of the police i think well firstly i mean four of my senior colleagues are, are black and minority ethnic officers which actually proportion is quite a lot the team of 28 senior officers um, and people will, will again judge that from outside the Met. I think the, the significant opportunity we have in London is despite the austere financial climate we're in, we're about to recruit 5,000 police officers into the Met because of the way we're reorganising. And our ambition is to try and recruit as many as those we can from London because at the end of the day we do want to reflect not just the, how the population looks, how the population feels and attitudes within Be the within community, London. as David Lamont said. Pastor, I just wonder what, what, what your experience is aware of this. Because, I mean, you're a leader within your community. Do you, do you find that you should explain perhaps to some young people, look, this is maybe irritating, but actually it might also cut down gun crime, drug crime and so on, the things that we're all too familiar with? Uh, yeah, well, I don't know if it's my duty to explain to those young people because I'm not always with them. And their experience is so real and so, uh, so true that I can't say it doesn't happen to them. I will tell you this, though. Uh, outside of my church, on a Sunday evening at church service, uh, two guys were coming in who were members of the church. <clears throat> and they were stopped by six police outside, and they did not accept that they were coming into church. So what we do now as a church to kind of combat that sort of approach is to say, well, look, let us organize ourselves. So our church is a member of uh, the Citizens UK. Uh, London citizens and we work with the Metropolitan Police and City Safe programs and we say let's organize ourselves let's get ourselves together because in truth we can't actually expect an institution to actually cater for the needs of our community. Do you, have so, so the community, you're basically saying the community's got responsibilities, you've got responsibilities as well. Yeah, it's, not it, just, it's not just pointing the finger at the police. Right, it, it, it's, it's twofold. So it's uh, you know, uh, two prongs of a fork as it were. There is a job that the police have to do, but there's also a job that us as a community have to do. We have to organise. Do, do you know, I just wonder what you felt that uh, you know, the assistant commissioner is talking about. Things have definitely changed uh, in all sorts of ways, but do, uh, do you see that stop and search is still a major irritant or is it something less of an irritant? And no, it is an irritant, I have to say. And I think when you look at the McPherson report and the recommendations, he talked very explicitly about institutional racism. So you have to keep the spotlight on the institution. And in that instance, you're talking about the police. And I can talk about stop and search because it happened to me four years ago when I was on my way to the BBC to be a guest on a right. show. And it was interesting because it was a knife search at a tube station. So I got searched and I didn't mind. I was really for that. You know, I want to join in helping to, you know, fight knife crime just like anybody else. However, when I got to the BBC, there was another guest there. She was white, similar age to me. She said what happened to her at the tube station was the police waved her around the metal detector. And you have to ask yourself, why is that happening? She looked very different from me. I look very much like I do today with my jeans, with my boots on. So you have to ask yourself, is there a type of look that people are looking for? But I have to say, I was really encouraged by this because when I phoned the police to complain, I was actively advised to complain. So, and you were advised by the police? Yes, to yes, and I don't ah, think that would have happened years 20 ago. 20 years ago. But I have to say, you know, we were talking about complaints going down in relation to stop and search. Uh, when I spoke to my family, a lot of them said they wouldn't have even bothered to phone the police. So complaints might have gone down, but is that signifying complaints have gone down or that people and just what? can't be bothered? Did you, did you find out why? I did find out why, and it was. <laughs> you could take this as a compliment, which I decided not to do. They thought I was in the 18 to 30 age range and that I might have been a gang member's girlfriend carrying their weapons for uh -huh. them, really. But you have to put that alongside mm. somebody else, similar group, different ethnicity, gets waved around the metal detector. 
I get stopped and served. Do you want to come in on that? Uh, yeah, I think it's a very good point, actually, because uh, I, I, you know, go back four years ago, I think if you go into all the facts and figures and you quoted some in your film, that generally the most experience of stop search with the Met is, is driven by two powers. One, one comes from when we generally want to look for people that are behaving suspiciously, and we're looking for stolen goods, and we're looking for drugs, and that causes some, some of the anxiety. But particularly, it sounds like the example you're talking about is something we call, it's a Section 60 search, where there's been either violence in a particular location, or we fear it. And that, that, that power, which has to be signed off by a senior officer, gives officers the, the permission to effectively randomly search people. I'm guessing that's what happened to you. It, now, but, since but that randomly, I think you have to think, if you're going to do that, why not let everyone go through the yeah, metal detector? Surely that's the thing. Is that, is that the issue? When that's, you see yeah, somebody yeah, who's similar yeah. to you, but the, the race Absolutely. is different. Absolutely. So there must right. be some kind of profiling yeah. going on no, out I, there. I, I, really. I, I, it's, again, yeah. it's, a, it's a very interesting issue, and I think I'll say a few things. It's four years ago. Those powers that probably were used in that example, obviously I don't know specifically, mm -hmm. but they have reduced by nearly 99%. So that, that when it used to be almost sort of a tick in the box and they were like confetti, we don't do operations like that routinely anymore. I think the other thing is, and I've gone through this training myself, part of the, the, the guidance that's given to frontline officers, we've got a, a, an online training package that every operational officer in the Met has been asked to complete, and it talks about no hunches and no stereotypes. So we are learning from experience like yours to make sure we're far more directed and intelligent and led. And I'm actually quite convinced that some of the dramatic falls in crime we've seen this year is because we're targeting to the right people. Just recently, with help from the community. Well, we're just talking about an experience in, in, think, in, in, in. I want to bring in everybody else. But do you think that's that? But just that, briefly, do you think that's true that there's more help from the community now that things have changed or not? I'm not sure. You know, because when I talk to the young men in my family, so many of them are stopped and searched. They wear suits. They drive cars. So when I talk to people at the grassroots, people are kind of reticent sometimes yeah. about helping and supporting the police. Reverend Rose, because we began this by talking about how institutions have changed. I mean, you're part of various institutions in a way. Do, do you think that has changed and that people see much more of a stake in society? There's much more opportunities within various black communities to get on. I think I would have to say that there have been some changes over the 20 years, but not enough. And if I was writing a school report, I would, I would say there is still a lot more work to be done. And that's the reality. You know, the police is only a, a small section of society, so to speak. Um, and they are from the community. I think that there is still profiling going on, not just in your institution, but in other institutions. I mean, 17 years ago, I approached a, a, a group, a religious group, church group, and I said to them, if you have a vacancy and I apply for it, would you accept me? Would you, you know, offer me an interview? And this wonderful, beautiful Christian woman looked at me and she said, we don't have any black people here. So why would we think of having you? And I smiled and I said, oh, isn't that interesting? So you can go to the inner city or you can go to Africa, etc., and work with black people. Wow, right. But we can't come and work with you. So I think there is something there. In Still still in people's mind and that was 17 years ago and I could guarantee you that there is still that mentality today it hasn't gone very far so there there is an issue still in society in terms of racism. Sean I mean you broke into one of the great British institutions Oxford for a start I mean did you, but, uh, but did you feel when you looked around at the other students I mean did you feel you fit it in, you don't fit in, you fit in intellectually, but you're, a, you're different. It's a really interesting point. I've never personally experienced overt racism, um, never at my time at Oxford, for example. Um, however, you do have to stop and think every now and again. You kind of look up from your books, as it were, and you realise there aren't all that many people around m myself that look like myself, for example. And then you, you ask the question, why is that? Is it me who's overachieving? Is it because um, this is normal? Um, is it because I got lucky? Um, going into Oxford, um, I went to a state school, a state secondary school. Um, um, I live on a council estate. I did for most of my life. Um, I was raised by a single mother. So from a demographic perspective, I, I live in central London, for example. From a demographic perspective, it shouldn't necessarily work. But for some reason, I did manage to achieve it. And I didn't overtly feel any problems whilst I was there in terms of racial tension. But the reality was, from a statistical perspective, I was in, I think, statistically, black people who are males are getting to Oxford are in less than 1.1% of the population. And, is it, and what you do now in your profession? 
professional life. Mm. It, it, do you still have that same kind of looking around saying where people look like me? Evidently, yes. Again, it's, it's, it's something that you don't necessarily feel. Nobody brings it up. Nobody makes you feel uncomfortable. I've never, I've never felt uncomfortable. It's just the sheer numbers when you stop and think it, and realize that it's just you or maybe you and one other person. That it, it makes you ask questions, that's all. Drita, I mean, the pastor uh, pointed out that everybody's got responsibility here, including, including communities. I mean, where, where, where is the, where's the problem? You see, do you see this as a problem or, or do you see I, this as I, a beginning of opportunities but might take a, a very long time? I'm actually not sure that I agree with the whole premise that it's a two-way thing, that the community has to do it along with, with the institutions. What we have is a very clear signal from the McPherson report and recommendation institutional racism for the first time in society we have to wake up to racism is not about one individual it's not about a few um, rotten apples in a barrel you're talking about institutions and particularly in that instant public institutions that are there to serve everyone that's what we should be really talking about I feel uh, an American politician once talked about the, the the bigotry of low expectations mm -hmm. and that does affect the community though doesn't right. it if you if people it, we, think that you're not going to achieve you right. might not achieve I think I think there's there's got to be something to be said, and I'm, I'm, I'm not disagreeing with you. you I understand your point. <laughs> no, I understand your point, yeah. but there has to be something to said that what are we doing for ourselves? Are we educating ourselves? Are we mentoring ourselves? And that, that quote that you uh, uh, said from the post, there's, there's another guy called, uh, I think it's Dr. Woodson, uh, Carter Woodson. He wrote the book, um, The Miseducation of the Negro. And basically in that book, he said that if you can train someone to use the back door, they will never seek to use the front door. And what, what has happened over the time, over, over uh, a generation, is that unfortunately we have not, as a, as a, as a, a community, um, really taken hold of ourselves. Uh, uh, what do you think of that, Rose? Racism is about power, having the power over right. an individual. So it's not just about, I don't like you because of the color mm -hmm. of your skin. What we are dealing with today is a legacy of empire that says the black person is of no worth, is of no value. And so, for example, every time we talk about why don't we have more black people in the police, in the church, in the, in the BBC, for example, <laughs> then we get to, oh, but we need to have the right person. As implying that we haven't got the skills and the ability, etc., to do it. We are capable of being trained just like you are. You know? And so there is a real issue. We need to change the tunes in our head and stop impacting on the lives of, of, of people just, locally. We've just got a couple of minutes left. You give one definition of racism. I mean, the one thing that probably strikes all of us is the kind of football chance, the overt Mm -hmm. of it. It's still there, oh, but absolutely. it's much, much diminished, isn't it? It is, but I, see, I think we keep talking about that too much. That's not what we're talking about. It's picking up, it's an issue about power, institutions, mm -hmm. and there's only so much a community can do. Mm -hmm. At the end of the day, if they are blocked, what more can they do? It's the institution that has to change. And we also need to look, if it's interesting, sports, mm -hmm. interesting, um, music, those feel loads and loads and mm -hmm. loads of people from minority ethnic background because there's an expectation Absolutely. and there was a time when institutions like education used to channel our children into those areas and what we've seen is that young black people growing up have seen reflections of themselves in those areas so they know they can do it but they're not seeing reflections ah. of themselves mm. in other areas so, I think that's a, a very yeah, go interesting on, point I think um, of yesteryear, particularly from a that grapejuice.net perspective in the music industry, you'll find, you know, in the 90s, for example, we went through an era of rappers and it was very bling and the black people that were represented were very um, flamboyant, they were largely uneducated, um, they flashed their money. It wasn't the best representation of sure. black people. Absolutely. However, I, th I feel like what you've seen over time, I think um, a perfect example is the rapper Jay-Z. So he's, he's been around for a very long time and he's made that transition to the modern day. While I, I personally believe he's been respected more as an entrepreneur, as a businessman, and all that, that previous culture of what it meant to be successful and black is slowly being diminished. Just, just a, a final question. Uh, I mean, your sense right from the start of this conversation is the Met still has a long way to go. I think the, the Met has somewhere to go in some things. The, I think the fact the best people to judge are the people in the room and the people that we police in London. Because obviously if I'm inside the Met looking out, I'm, I'm going to be tainted by some of my own personal experience. But I think in terms of optimism, I think we're listening. Even the, the last bit of the discussion, even you know, the, the Met is on the cost of ideas around direct entry. So we can, if you're looking at the point about if we need to have role models, if we need to encourage 
people that there is a future in policing for people from all sorts of communities across London. Well, there's probably some people sitting in the room I'd encourage to look at our direct entry screen when it's launched. Okay, we'll leave it there. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you.